Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, Center of International Law and Human Rights uh, first uh, speaker series, uh, first uh, talk of our speaker series this term. I'm very pleased uh, to welcome Dr. Agata uh, Kletkowska, um, who uh, is coming from the Polish Academy of Sciences. And uh, she studied um, uh, various aspects of the use of force in relation to non-state groups. Uh, she is uh, the managing editor of the European uh, uh, Central and East European Law Journal and a, uh, a member of the expert pool on the European Centre of Excellence and Countering Hybrid Threats. And uh, the subject of her talk today will be very much um, about uh, threats currently being made against Ukraine. Some of those threats have in the past been hybrid threats. Now they're much more overt uh, military threats. So she is someone uh, who has uh, a great deal of expertise in this area. So she will be talking about Russia's activities against Ukraine and international law. And just uh, a little bit of uh, housekeeping for everyone. If you would like to uh, ask a question to Agatha, then if you look uh, on the top uh, bar of the screen, there should be a little uh, Q and A um, icon. It's a little a little uh, speech bubble with a question mark. Just click on that and you can write your questions uh, to to Agatha. So uh, thanks. Thanks for everyone for joining us and uh, over to you, Agatha. Thank you very much, James, for the introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. I am very pleased and honored that uh, I have the chance to uh, give this talk and uh, I'm uh, really looking forward to your questions. As uh, James said, this is a very current topic and a very, very important one. So uh, the more I am happy that uh, I, I am able to talk a little bit about this. So uh, the plan uh, for today uh, is to start from a short factual background. Uh, I will talk briefly about uh, three stages that are important for the uh, um, conflict in Ukraine. So the Euromaidan, Crimea and then Donbas. Uh, in the second part, I would like to uh, discuss just some of the questions of international law that appear with relation to the conflict in Ukraine. So the aggression, the consequences of the aggression, uh, the armed conflict itself and the ICC investigation. And um, in the final part I will talk about the most recent threat uh, against Ukraine. Uh, so uh, let me uh, start uh, from this brief factual background. Uh, so it all started on the 21st November 2013 uh, when Viktor Yanukovych, uh, the president of Ukraine at that time, announced that he would not sign the association agreement with the EU. Uh, that announcement resulted in protests uh, after police violently broke up demonstration on the 30 November, mass protests started. And on the 1st of December 2013, nearly a million people rallied in the Maidan and so the main square of Kiev and continued to occupy the city square for weeks uh, to come. Uh, the protesters named your Maiden uh, included not only citizens with pro-Western views, but also people who were infuriated by the level of corruption of the government and by police and security forces um, brutality and demanded the uh, government's resignation. Uh, also in coming weeks, the Ukrainian parliament passed restricted anti-protest laws, which further infuriated the demonstrators and intensified the violence. At the end of January, uh, Prime Minister Mykola Azarov uh, resigned and the parliament annulled the anti-protest law. Uh, parliament passed the amnesty bill, but the opposition rejected uh, the conditions of it. On the 22nd of February, uh, President Yanukovych fled to the capital and protesters took control of the residence and the administration buildings. Uh, the picture uh, comes actually from the inside of the Yanukovych residence, uh, which was um, con uh, which was uh, then uh, after the uh, he fled turned into a museum now. So uh, it shows uh, how much um, wealth was there in the hands of the government. Uh, so, uh, for a while, um, uh, the location of Yanukovych was uh, not announced to the public, although it was known that he fled to Russia. 
Um, after he left Ukraine, he sent a letter to Russian news agencies claiming that he still remains a lawful president of Ukraine. Um, however, he never returned again uh, to Ukraine. In 2019, a Ukrainian court has found him guilty of high treason and sentenced him in absentia to 13 years in prison over attempts to quash a 2014 pro-Western uprising. Uh, after Yanukovych fled, uh, Parliament appointed Speaker Alexander Turchinov as interim uh, president and Arseniy Yatsenyuk as prime minister. So now I would like to move on to the um, other the, the other stage of the um, events in 2014, uh, namely Crimea. Uh, so as long as the situation in Kiev started to calm down uh, and the new government was formed, uh, at the same time, events in Crimea and in eastern Ukraine uh, started to raise considerable doubts. Uh, from the end of January 2014, uh, Russia began to strengthen its military presence in Crimea by transporting troops by air, land and sea. In late January 2014, a Russian transport aircraft brought contingents of paratroops uh, to the naval bases and additional military personnel. Uh, Russian troops uh, arrived at the port of uh, Kerch and Sevastopol, while eight large landing crafts entered the port uh, of Kerch. What you need to know is that Russia in general was authorized to uphold its military presence in Crimea. In 1997, Ukraine and Russia signed agreement between uh, the Russian Federation and um, Ukraine on the status and the conditions of the presence of the Black Sea Fleet of the Russian Federation on the territory of Ukraine. Article 4 of this agreement stated that the total uh, personal strength, the number of ships, vessels, armament and military equipment of the Black Sea Fleet of the Russian Federation located on the territory of Ukraine shall not exceed the limits established in the agreement between the Russian Federation and Ukraine uh, and uh, that Russian side shall inform the Ukrainian side of the total personal strength and the main armament of the Black Sea Fleet of the Russian Federation located on the territory of Ukraine. Uh, in 2010, Russia and Ukraine signed another agreement on the presence of the Black Fleet of the Russian Federation on the territory of Ukraine, which prolonged the duration of the 1997 agreement. Uh, nevertheless, the number of troops transported by Russia to Crimea in January and February 2014 uh, substantially exceeded the limits allowed under the agreement. In late February 2014, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine sent a formal note of protest to the Russian Federation, uh, but Russia replied that the movement of vehicles had been uh, due to the increased emergency measures for the protection of the Black Sea uh, fleet deployment locations. And uh, now, uh, a very important date. On the 27th February 2014, over uh, 100 heavily armed men stormed the buildings of the Supreme Council and the Council of Ministers of the Autonomous Republic of Crimea. According to witnesses, uh, these members were actually members of the Russian Special Forces. After the seizure of these buildings, the Russian flag was raised above the parliament building while armed tr uh, Russian troops uh, in uniforms started to patrol the vicinity of the building. On the same day, paramilitary supported by Russia rounded up and transferred members of the Crimean Supreme Court into the parliament building, uh, thus uh, forcibly assembled under duress from armed uh, Russian military personnel, cut off from outside communication and without the requisite quorum. Uh, the members of the uh, Supreme Council adopted resolutions in which inter alia they appointed, they appointed Sergei Aksyonov as head of the Climate Council, uh, Crimean Council of Ministers, and declared referendum on improving the status and powers of the Autonomous Republic of Crimea, uh, scheduled uh, for 25 May 2014. Um, also, on the same day, Russia dramatically increased its direct presence in Crimea and took the steps to block civilian infrastructure and prevent the Ukrainian military from defending Crimea. Thus, by nightfall of 27 February 2014, uh, the civilian authorities in Crimea had been removed by force and replaced with agents of the Russian Federation. And 27 February is considered as a day when Russia started the occupation of Crimea and committed aggression um, uh, against Ukraine. 
On 1st March 2014, uh, Aksyanov called uh, the President of Russian Federation to ensure peace and security in Crimea. Uh, and in accordance with that request, on the same day, President Putin submitted an appeal to the Federation uh, Council of the Federal Assembly of the Russian Federation, asking the Council to use the armed forces of the Russian Federation on the territory of Ukraine until the social and political situation in that country is normalized. Um, the, later, the, the Russian representative in the UN Security Council will say that since the request considered uh, the use of uh, the armed forces on the territory of the Ukraine, not against Ukraine, uh, this was actually not a request uh, to violate Article 4, but it was simply a request to deploy some forces, but not uh, in contravention of international law. Of course, um, this uh, this argument is groundless. Uh, on 6 March 2014, uh, Crimean Supreme Council purported to take a decision to annex the Crimean Peninsula to the Russian Federation without holding any form of plebiscite, but at the end it only rescheduled uh, the referendum for 16 March 2014. On 11 March, the Supreme Council adopted a declaration of independence of Crimea and Sevastopol, which was immediately recognized as lawful by the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Russian Federation. On 16 March, uh, the referendum took place. Uh, voters had to answer two questions. Uh, do you support reunifying Crimea with Russia as a subject of the Russian Federation? Uh, and do you support the restoration of the 1992 Crimean Constitution and the status of Crimea as a part of Ukraine? Uh, so, um, over allegedly 90% of voters supported uh, the accession to the Russian uh, Federation. Uh, nevertheless, the referendum was declared illegal and invalid by many international institutions and states for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, the referendum was illegal under Ukrainian constitution, which states that Ukraine, Ukraine is a unitary state and that the territory of Ukraine within the limits of existing borders is integral and inviolable. This is consistent with Article 134 of the Constitution, which calls Crimea an inalienable component part of Ukraine. Um, secondly, the referendum failed to meet some international standards, which are included in their earlier in Article 25 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, or in Article 3 uh, of the First Protocol to the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, on 18 March 2014, um, Russian Federation, the Republic of Crimea and the city of Sevastopol signed the agreement on the accession of the Republic of Crimea into the Russian Federation and on forming new constituent entities within the Russian Federation, which is also known as the Treaty of Unification. Uh, the picture here shows the moment when the agreement was signed. Uh, on 20 March, the State Duma of the Russian Federation voted to accept Crimea and Sevastopol and ratified the Treaty of 18 March and on the 21st March, the Federation Council joined Crimea and Sevastopol to the Russian Federation. Uh, and finally, let's move to the last arena, um, which today most often appears in the headlines, uh, which is the, of course, the Eastern Ukraine. A quick comment regarding terminology. Um, I am sure that all of you heard the term Donbas. Uh, I will also use it. Uh, Donbas um, refers simply to Donetsk and Luhansk regions. Uh, this name comes from the term Donetsk Coal Basin, as it uh, used to be a very hectic mining region. Uh, and to give you also some uh, demograph uh, demographical backgrounds, according to 2001 census, 39% uh, uh, of the inhabitants of the Luhansk Oblast and over 38% of the population of the Donetsk Oblast were Russians. And to Russian was the main language of uh, over 74% of residents in Donetsk Oblast and over 68% in Luhansk Oblast. So in March 2014, Immediately following the annexation of Crimea, uh, the pro-Russian protests uh, fueled by Russia started uh, in three eastern Ukrainian cities, in Kharkov, in Luhansk and Donetsk. Uh, Pro-Russian protesters seized control of governmental buildings in Donetsk, Luhansk, Kharkov, Slovyansk, Harlivka and Kramatorsk uh, and calling for a referendum on independence. Uh, 
On 11 May 2014, um, the separatists organized a referendum on self rule, in which a majority of voters supported the independence of these regions from Ukraine. As a result, on the very next day, the leaders of the separatists declared the creation of the Luhansk uh, Donetsk uh, People's Republic and Donetsk People's Republic. Both republics uh, received the recognition only from each other and from another uh, disputed entity, namely South Ossetia. Uh, Russia did not recognize the republics, but following the self rule referenda, Russian Minister of Foreign Affairs, Sergei Lavrov, said that his state will respect the will of the people of Ukraine. Uh, the latest news is that on 19 January this year, 11 members of the uh, State Duma registered a draft law actually to recognize the independence of these two separatist republics. It is not clear whether the law has the chance to be accepted because the draft law was not submitted by government, by, by the Communist Party, which has no majority in Duma. But the question is why Russia did not recognize uh, the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republic in 2014, but wants to do it uh, only now. Well, there are two possible answers uh, to the question. Uh, the first one is that uh, maybe sanctions imposed on uh, Russia after the annexation of Crimea were so harsh that Putin did not want to risk with another wave of sanctions, which would follow when uh, Russia would um, recognize um, the, the Luhansk and Donetsk People's Republic. But th there is also a second explanation, which is linked with the a protocol on the results of consultations of the trilateral contact group. This is the so-called Minsk Agreement 1. There was also uh, the Minsk Agreement, uh, the second Minsk Agreement uh, in 2015. Uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, the first Minsk Agreement, which was signed on 5 September 2014 by the OCE representative, Ukrainian and Russian representative, and leader of uh, rebels, uh, Zaharenko and Plotnitsky, uh, stated uh, that inter alia um, that parties obliged to ensure the immediate bilateral cessation of the use of weapons, implement the centralization of power, including by enacting the law of Ukraine on the interim status of local self-government in certain areas of Donetsk and Luhansk regions, enact a law prohibiting the um, prosecution and punishment of persons in connection with the events that took place in uh, certain areas of Donetsk and Luhansk, and ensure the holding of early local elections in accordance with the law of Ukraine. Ukraine uh, on the interim status of the local self-government in Luhansk and Donetsk. So Kremlin decided to uh, decline to consider recognizing the independence of this self-proclaimed republics in 2014, because uh, if it did it, it would allow Kyiv to escape its own obligations under uh, the Minsk Agreement 1. So uh, Russia's uh, recognition of uh, the self-declared republics uh, would effectively mean its withdrawal from the uh, Minsk agreement. Well, today it is legitimate to say uh, that the Minsk agreement one and also the Minsk agreement two, uh, they lost its effectiveness. So I guess Russia doesn't care anymore and it, it is uh, free to, it, it feels it is free to withdraw um, uh, from uh, de facto from this Minsk agreement. Um, just a word more about the events in Donbas in 2014. Uh, so uh, the, uh, of course, uh, the uh, since May fightings ensued throughout the eastern region of Donbas. Uh, it would be a very long story to talk now about the changing positions and uh, changing uh, intensity of fights and the uh, lack of each of the side. Uh, but um, Today, it is legitimate to say that the front lines of the conflict have uh, barely moved in the last five years. Uh, nevertheless, there are still some uh, small scale clashes and uh, sniper attacks, but nevertheless, uh, the front line is quite uh, calm now and for the last five years. So now I would like to move. Yeah, this is the um, this is a picture uh, very recent coming from the uh, from front line. So as you see, there is there is no shooting, there is no fighting. Um, now I would like to move to the uh, questions uh, uh, connected with international law. Uh, 
namely, I would uh, like to discuss uh, major questions um, that arise with regard to what happened in 2013 and 2014 uh, in Ukraine. Uh, whereas, uh, well, there, there's a lot of uh, questions that I could talk about, um, but uh, let me focus just on the most important issues. So I will start from the use of force slash aggression. So um, I think I don't have to present Article 24 of the UN Charter and the definition of aggression. We are all familiar with that. So the question is, did uh, uh, what happened in Crimea amount to the use of force? Um, I did not mention any clashes between Ukrainian and Russian forces uh, when uh, Russia started to size uh, Crimea, not because I forgot to do that, but because there were no actually clashes between Ukrainian and Russian uh, during that time. Uh, also, President Putin claimed that um, no case of the use of force was at stake at all, since, as he said in his address to the uh, Duma deputies, I cannot recall a single case in history of an intervention without a single shot being fired and with no human casualties. Uh, moreover, he uh, also said that armed forces never entered Crimea. They were they're already in line with an international agreement. True, we did enhance our forces there. However, and this is something I would like to everyone to hear and know, we did not exceed the personal limit of our armed forces in Crimea, which is set at 25,000 because there was no need to do so. Of course, they did exceed. Uh, from the perspective of international law, even though the events in Crimea um, no, indeed differed uh, from the other armed interventions carried out by states after 1945, both with regard uh, to their course and the employed means, uh, the Russian involvement may still uh, nevertheless be labeled as a use of force against Ukraine. Why? Uh, first of all, uh, irrespective of the fact that uh, no shots have been fired, uh, the Russian action represents a prima facie violation of the fundamental uh, part of the prohibition of the use of force, namely the transfer of uh, one state's armed forces into another in significant numbers without the consent of a state. Uh, and obviously that violates Article 2, uh, 4 of the UN Charter, uh, whether large scale of death and destruction is used or no. Um, secondly, uh, gravity does not need to be measured solely by the intensity of fighting and the number of victims. The intentions of the aggressor and the consequences that the improper use of its forces deployed in the territory of another state could have are also important factors to consider. In this case, Russia's aim was to take control over Crimea with the result of annexation of the peninsula. Thus, the serious gravity and intentions and consequences um, are out of the question, are obvious. Uh, thirdly, uh, one also has to be reminded the justifications which were presented by Russia following the annexation of Crimea, because actually they resembled very much the justifications which are usually invoked by states uh, in case of the use of force. So, speaking of Russian justifications, they invoked the following arguments. Uh, first of all, that there were persecutions of inhabitants of Crimea by Kiev authorities. Um, they stated that during the years that Peninsula was forced to be part of Ukraine, many social economic problems accumulated. Russia will try to solve them uh, uh, in a systematic way. That will not be affected by efforts on the part of Kiev authorities to take revenge on the population uh, of Crimea for their decision to join Russia. Uh, the Kiev authorities have erected all kinds of obstacles and have been broadcasting anti-Crimean propaganda in an unbridled manner. Uh, secondly, uh, Russia claimed that uh, Sergei Aksionov, uh, the Prime Minister of Crimea, requested the President of Russia for assistance to restore peace in Crimea. Uh, also, allegedly, such request uh, was made by President Yanukovych already after he fled Kyiv. Uh, he said, uh, he sent uh, in a letter sent to President Putin, as the legitimately elected President of Ukraine, 
Uh, I wish to inform you that events in my country and capital have placed Ukraine on the brink of civil war. Chaos and anarchy reign throughout the country. Uh, the life, security and rights of the people, particularly in the southeast and in Crimea, are under threat. Open acts of terror and violence are being committed under the influence of Western countries. People are being persecuted on the basis of their language and political beliefs. I therefore call on President Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin of Russia to use the armed forces of the Russian Federation to establish Establish legitimacy, peace, law, and order, and stability in defense of uh, people of Ukraine. Um, obviously, as we all know, the um, uh, president, which has no all, longer effective power over a state, um, has no right to ask for an armed intervention, and that was obviously the case here. And finally, Russia also claimed that it has to protect the Russian minority uh, in Ukraine. Uh, so I told you what were the proportions of the um, uh, citizens of Russia in Donbas and Lu uh, Luhansk in 2001, uh, but also since 2010, Russia has began to employ a policy of distributing Russian passports to individuals uh, in Crimea. Uh, this process, known as passportization, uh, produced uh, or rather enlarged Russian minority in uh, Crimea. Uh, this process does not stop with the annexation of Crimea, as it is estimated that up to 2021, 600,000 passports uh, had been issued to inhabitants of Donetsk and Luhansk by Russia. Uh, it is also thanks to the executive order on identifying groups of persons entitled to a fast track procedure when applying for Russian citizenship on humanitarian grants from 2019, uh, which allowed permanent residents from certain districts of Ukraine uh, from Donetsk and Luhansk regions be entitled to a fast track procedure when applying for the Russian citizenship. So they firstly produce Russian minority and then claim that they have to protect it. And that's how justified the intervention. So um, I guess uh, what Russia did in Crimea can be qualified as um, aggression uh, under Article 3 of the definition of aggression, uh, namely uh, First of all, as the invasion or attack by the armed forces of a state of the territory of another state or any military occupation uh, uh, resulting from such invasion or attack or any annexation by the use of force. And also as the use of armed forces of one state which are within the territory of another state with the agreement of the receiving state in contravention of the conditions provided for in the agreement or any extension of their presence in such territory beyond the termination of the agreement. Um, so that was aggression. Um, I am aware that there are different um, views and mutual relations between what is aggression, what is an arm attack, whether every time arm attack amounts to aggression. But let's assume that in case of Crimea, this aggression also amounted to an arm attack. So if it was an arm attack, why Ukraine did not use force in self-defense? Well, the easiest answer to it is that uh, Ukraine was too weak, both politically and militarily, uh, to effectively defend itself from Russia. Uh, and it feared uh, triggering only bigger military confrontation. Um, sure, but since 2014, um, Ukraine strengthened both its army and its democracy. So maybe now uh, Ukraine could invoke the right to self-defense and attack Russia um, in use of force and self-defense. Well, when it comes to uh, whether it is possible and whether it is legal under international law, there are actually different views presented. So uh, when it comes to the argument for such solution, namely that actually Russia could now, uh, after years, use force and self-defense against uh, Russia, uh, the first argument is that Russia still occupies Crimea. Uh, definition of aggression mentions occupation as one of the forms of aggression, as I said. And if to assume that occupation amounts to continuous armed attack, that self-defense is possible as long as occupation lasts. Uh, also, uh, those who claim that Ukraine is no longer uh, is allowed to use for, uh, no longer allowed to use force in self-defense actually allow Russia to get away with this aggression. And that is certainly not the purpose of neither the prohibition of the use of force nor the right to self-defense. And uh, thirdly, saying that Ukraine is no longer allowed to self-defense is in contravention of the principle ex injuria use non orator. 
On the contrary, the argument that Ukraine is no longer allowed to use force in self-defense within the um, come within the traditional understanding of the criteria of self-defense. So, as you all obviously know, one of the fundamental requirements of legal self-defense is necessity, while one of the components of necessity is requirement of immediacy, which refers to the time when a state responding to an attack launches its repulsive action. The longer the period between the arm attack and the response, uh, the more pressure there will be on the state concerned to resolve the matter by peaceful means. And moreover, the more time elapses between the arm attack and the reply to it, the harder it will become to distinguish between self-defense and reprisals if a state still decides to react military. Uh, secondly, uh, Article 51 of the UN Charter states that nothing in the present Charter shall impair the inherent right of individual or collective self-defense if an arm attack occurs against a member of the United Nations. Thus, self-defense is allowed when an arm attack occurs, so at a very specific point of time, not when an arm attack continues to last, if to assume that occupation is a continuous arm attack. Um, then, prohibition of the use of force. Uh, the aim of the prohibition was to safeguard the international peace and security, and that also includes uh, not starting over frozen, frozen conflicts. And finally, disputes, including also territorial disputes, uh, should not be uh, under above the UN Charter and the Declaration on Principles of International Law. So, uh, they should be solved by peaceful means, not by the use of force. Uh, for me, uh, the um, arguments against uh, actually um, uh, against the possibility for Ukraine to now use force in self-defense are more convincing. Uh, but I am uh, looking forward. Uh, what is your opinion on that? Okay, so the use of force, aggression, or arm attack occurred, uh, whichever of these terms better describes what happened. Uh, and we can certainly say that uh, Russia flagrantly violated international law. So now let's move on to the uh, consequences of this uh, violation. Um, as I said, uh, the use of force and subsequent annexation of Crimea amounted to a gross violation of international law, and consequently states are under an obligation not to recognize the illegal situation arising out of it. That is not to recognize Crimea as being a part of Russia. Uh, I claim that the obligation of non-recognition actually is composed of two parts. So, first of all, it uh, prohibits states from directly recognizing illegal territorial acquisitions as legal and uh, obliges states to uh, bring any such situation to an end. And secondly, it requires states uh, to refrain from implied recognition of illegal situations, which means that states are obliged to refrain from providing uh, support or any form of assistance in maintaining the illegal situation. And uh, states should uh, also refrain from applying the treaties concluded with the wrongdoing state to the illegally acquired territory. And uh, from uh, they should also refrain themselves from concluding any new treaties with the wrongdoing state, which would be applicable to illegally acquired territory. Of course, this component of the uh, obligation of non-recognition can be concretized in many different duties, example, gratuity obligation not to transfer funds, render military assistance, etc. So right after the annexation, the UN Security Council attempted uh, to adopt a resolution uh, which inter alia called upon all states, international organizations and specialized agencies not to recognize any alteration of the status of Crimea on the basis of this referendum and to refrain from any action or dealing that might be interpreted as recognizing uh, any such altered status. Um, the UN Security Council failed in adopting this resolution. Nevertheless, on 27 uh, March 2014, the UN General Assembly adopted Resolution 68-262, titled Territorial Integrity of Ukraine, which included quite a similar uh, appeal when it comes at least to the obligation of non-recognition. When it comes to the reaction of the international community uh, to the um, uh, annexation of Crimea and violation of international law by Russia. I would distinguish three groups uh, of reaction uh, within the international community. So the first group would be those actors uh, which reacted to the annexation in the most harsh and decisive manner. 
Uh, undoubtedly, the state that most powerfully proclaim and continues to proclaim the legality of Crimean annexation is the United States. In line with this approach, uh, the U.S. introduced sanctions against Russia, first established in a presidential executive order of 6 March 2014. Uh, the sanctions were first uh, and foremost targeted against persons responsible for or implicit in certain activities with respect to Ukraine, officials of the government of the Russian Federation, persons operating in the arms or related material sector of the Russian Federation, as well as individuals and entities operating in the Crimean region of Ukraine. Um, they also prohibited the importation of or exportation of goods, services or technology to or from the Ukrainian uh, uh, Crimean region of Ukraine, as well as new investment in the Crimea region of Ukraine uh, by a United States person, whatever located. Uh, the U.S. Department of State also issued the Ukraine Travel Advisory, which stated do not travel to Crimea due to the foreign occupation and abuses by occupation authorities. Uh, no less decisive was the reaction of the European Union. Uh, the first EU organ to issue a statement on the annexation of Crimea was the European Council, uh, which declared that it strongly condemned the annexation of Crimea and Sevastopol. Uh, the, EU, the EU further um, upheld this approach uh, and repeated it on multiple occasions. Uh, measures adopted by EU uh, as a consequence of its non-recognition of, uh, uh, of, of the annexation of Crimea included uh, inter alia freezing of assets, visa bans, ban on imports of goods originating from Crimea or Sevastopol unless they have Ukrainian certificates, a prohibition on investment in Crimea and ban on providing tourism services in Crimea or Sevastopol and many others. Uh, in addition, the EU issued guidelines recommending a common approach to be taken by member states towards Russian passports include, uh, issued in Crimea. Uh, the guidelines recommended non-recognition of Russian ordinary passports issued by Russian uh, administrative authorities in the Russian Federation to residents of Crimea and Sevastopol after the illegal annexation of these territories, unless these persons held Russian citizenship prior to the annexation. Uh, also, very decisive uh, steps were taken by the OC Council of Europe, among uh, states from outside the EU. Uh, also, sanctions and condemnation came from Norway, uh, Australia, Switzerland, Canada. Um, so, um, yeah. And when it comes to the second group of states, um, so it uh, comprises those which, even though they did not recognize um, Crimea as part of Russia and condemned the use of force against Ukraine and annexation of Crimea. Nevertheless, they adopted quite ambivalent attitude and failed to impose effective sanctions on Russia. And um, this group of states actually includes, for instance, Japan. On 18 March 2014, uh, the Japanese Minister for Foreign Affairs issued a statement on measures against Russia over the Crimean referendum in which it was declared uh, in their area that the referendum has no legal effect and Japan does not recognize its outcome. Immediately after the annexation, Russia also decided to suspend talks on the investment pact and on the relaxation of visa requirements, as well as banning certain financial transactions with uh, 40 individuals. Nevertheless, uh, these bans did not concern high-level officials who allegedly visited Japan in the aftermath of the annexation. And likewise, Japan never disclosed who was listed actually on this visa ban. Uh, reportedly, the reason for a Japanese assistance is the Japanese-Russian territorial dispute over the Kuril Islands. Uh, Japan sought to preserve the outcomes of the negotiations with Russia, uh, which very restrictive sanctions would place in jeopardy. Uh, just let me say that the uh, dispute over Coral Island is not solved until today. And uh, the, finally, there was also a group of states that decided uh, uh, to recognize actually the uh, annexation. Um, uh, uh, um, as for now, eight states um, did it. Uh, it in includes Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela, Syria, Afghanistan, North Korea, Bolivia and Kyrgyzstan. Uh, all the states have in explaining their approach repeated actually the Russian rhetoric uh, about the persecution of the Russian minority in Crimea and the historical ties between Crimea and Russia. 
To legitimize their decision, they also referred to the outcome of the referendum of 6 in March, claiming that the reunification with Russia was the result of the free will of the Crimean people, which should be respected. So now please let me move to the uh, question of armed conflict. Um, I'm sure all of you are familiar with this uh, ICTY definition of an armed conflict. Uh, of course, I'm taking now a huge shortcut, um, but uh, in general, we can say that uh, the international armed conflict um, is the one that takes place uh, at least between two states and non-international armed conflict is the one that uh, takes place on the territory of one state uh, between its armed forces and dissident armed forces or other organized armed groups and responsible command exercise such control over part of its territory as to enable them to carry out sustained and concerted operation and to, uh, to implement this protocol. Um, however, uh, knowing this definition, can we say if there is the international and non-international armed conflict in Ukraine, maybe there are both of them, so uh, let's start with the international armed conflict. So as I said, at least two states have to be involved. That is the case. There is Russia and Ukraine. Um, on 17 April 2014, during the annual special direct line with Vladimir Putin, uh, broadcast by the Russian TV and radio stations, a Russian president said, of course, Russian servicemen did back the Crimean self-defense forces. They acted in a civil but in a decisive and professional manner, and uh, as I've already said. Uh, however, then Russia changed this line of argumentation, as in January 2015, Russia denied that there was any proof that it sent its troops and weapons to eastern Ukraine. Then, in December 2015, President Putin again stated that we never said that there were not people who were carried out certain tasks, including the military sphere. I could invoke many more equally contradicting statements. Uh, despite um, that, there are countless proofs and countless testimonies by witnesses, reports coming from media who identified the fighters in Ukraine as Russian soldiers or at least Russian backed separatists, um, given that their guns, uniforms, vehicles and accent were similar to those identified with Russia. So even though Russia denies that uh, it was uh, it is involved in the conflict, it is involved in the conflict. There is the international armed conflict uh, between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, so, um, um, okay, so now the question comes uh, whether there is non-international armed conflict in Ukraine too. Uh, actually, many states, uh, scholars and experts claim that there are two parallel armed conflicts in Ukraine, both uh, international and non-international one. When it comes to non-international one, it takes place between Ukraine, Ukrainian forces and forces of the Donetsk and Luhansk uh, People's Republic. So, as I said, uh, it comes from the uh, second protocol. There are basically two uh, conditions uh, to form a non-international armed conflict. So the level of armed violence must reach a certain degree of intensity that goes beyond internal disturbances and tensions. So it certainly was achieved. And non-state armed group must exhibit a certain level of organization. Uh, the exact structure of both Donetsk and Luhansk um, armed forces is not uh, publicly known. Nevertheless, uh, there is um, uh, there is some structure as it is visible when it comes to the um, actions they are, for instance, carrying out that there, there is some common, that there are subordinates. So this is also uh, visible. Nevertheless, my view is that in Ukraine there is only an international armed conflict. Uh, and uh, I base this claim, uh, I will tell you in a moment on what argument, uh, but nevertheless, uh, those who claim that uh, there is uh, a non-international armed conflict claim that Russia cannot effectively control Luhansk and Donetsk People's Republic. I do not agree with that, and I will tell you in a moment why. So uh, since 2021, my institute uh, is a partner in the project financed by the Visegrad Fund, and I am personally responsible for our contribution to the project. In general, the aim of the project is to create a report which indicates the crimes committed during armed conflict in Ukraine since 2014 and to send it to the ICC. Why? Ukraine is not a party to the ICC. However, on 17 April 2014, Ukraine launched a declaration under Article uh, 12, uh, Paragraph 3 of the Rome Statute to the ICC, 
uh, related to alleged crimes committed on the territory of Ukraine during the period from 21st November 2014 to 22nd February 2014. On 8th September 2015, uh, the government of Ukraine lodged a second declaration, first you went to uh, Article 12, uh, um, Paragraph 3, accepting the exercise of jurisdiction by the court over alleged crimes committed in the territory of Ukraine since 20 February 2014 with no end date. On 25 April 2014, the prosecutor uh, opened, sorry, 2015, the prosecutor opened a preliminary uh, examination of the situation. And uh, its first focus on the Maidan events. Later, in accordance with the second Ukrainian declaration, prosecutor determined uh, to extend this temporal scope as requested by Ukraine. On 11 uh, December 2014, a prosecutor finished the pre preliminary examination and uh, the statement said that with, without prejudice to any other crimes which may be in, uh, in, uh, identified during the course of an investigation, Prosecutor has concluded that there is a reasonable basis at this time to believe that a broad range of conduct constituting war crimes and crimes against humanity within the jurisdiction of the court have been committed in the context of the situation in Ukraine. So, um, uh, the case, of course, needs to be also admissible before the court and the prosecutor's office came to the conclusion that the case of the crimes committed in Ukraine is actually admissible before uh, before um, before ICC. This is so because the competent authorities in Ukraine and slash or the Russian Federation are either inactive in relation to the categories of persons and conduct that the office has identified or because the national judicial system is unavailable in territory under the control of the opposing party, rendering the competent authorities unable generally to obtain uh, the accused or the necessary evidence and testimony or otherwise to carry out the, their proceedings. So the next step should be uh, for the judges of the pretrial chamber of the court to open an investigation. However, it did not happen since December 2020. Why? There are multiple reasons. First and foremost, they are connected with the constraints and functioning of the ICC uh, on one hand due to the COVID-19 pandemic. On the other hand, uh, by the limitations of operational capacity due to thin and overextended resources. To put it short, there is no money uh, to continue some of the investigations. However, there's also another problem. So, as I said, um, Ukraine lodged the declaration so, to sorry, the ICC. I just, uh, 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 we've got about five minutes probably left and then another five minutes for questions. Sure, sure. Okay. I will wrap it up. Uh, so uh, Ukraine um, lodged a declaration to the ICC on the grounds of Article 12.3 of the uh, ICC statute. Uh, uh, nevertheless, Ukraine signed the Rome statute in 2000, but it never ratified it. Uh, some amendments to the Ukrainian constitutions were needed and they were made even after 16 years, but they were made in 2016. Uh, but still, there is uh, no decision on the ratification and probably if the Ukraine ratified the ICC statute, it could speed up uh, investigation by the ICC. Why is it not uh, ratify it? I know from people who are within this governmental circus in Ukraine uh, that uh, Ukrainian uh, government is afraid that ICC will investigate not only crimes committed by Russian, side of the conflict, but also by Ukrainians. Obviously, anyway, ICC will investigate it. So whenever uh, Ukraine ratifies the statute or not, uh, ICC people from ICC are already in Ukraine and they're investigated it. So it really doesn't matter. And but the ratification would uh, help uh, a lot. Uh, also, uh, what I wanted to say is um, that uh, my part of the uh, report, which I mentioned, uh, concerns the crimes committed in Donbas. And uh, actually, uh, the more I read it, the more I get familiar with the what happened uh, in Donbas since 2014 the more terrified I am that such uh, things could happen in Europe in the 21st century. Uh, one of the things is the battle over uh, airport in Donetsk um, in 2015 when uh, treacherously uh, the defenders of the airport uh, from the Ukrainian side were killed by the uh, militants, um, so the separatist forces. Uh, this is the airport in Donetsk before the battle. This is after the battle, so over 100, over 100 Ukrainian soldiers were killed. And another case uh, which is very outraging is the battle over Ilovaisk, uh, 
uh, when um, the Russians uh, allowed um, Ukrainian soldiers to create a humanitarian corridor and to leave the city. And while they were leaving, they opened fire to them. And uh, as you see, over 600 soldiers were killed. So this is obviously uh, outraging war crimes which were committed then. Um, yeah, and to wrap it up, the um, last part um, of my presentation uh, was about to concern the most current threats. So this is the satellite pictures of the uh, Russian forces which are gathered next to the Ukrainian border. Uh, so as you all probably know that Russia made um, demands to the NATO uh, that NATO will not remove any troops or weapons deployed to countries, will remove any troops or weapons deployed to countries that enter the alliance after 1997, uh, that NATO will rule out further expansion, including the expansion to Ukraine and Georgia, and NATO will hold the drills, will not hold drills without previous agreement from Russia and Ukraine, Eastern Europe and Caucasus countries. Uh, so uh, for Russia, these are legal guarantees for obviously NATO. These are demands which cannot be um, bought to. And there were some meetings between NATO representatives and the Russian representatives. As far as I know, uh, NATO representatives offered to Russia some um, um, some um, uh, proposals to reduce the armaments, maybe on uh, disarmaments in Eastern and Central Europe. Uh, but of course, for Russia, this is not satisfying. Uh, yesterday, President Biden took the decision to send additional troops to Poland, uh, to Romania and to Germany, uh, additional 3000 soldiers. So we didn't know what's going on. Maybe there are some information about the uh, attack um, coming in a few days now. Of course, under Article 5 of the NATO Treaty, uh, the uh, President Biden said that the uh, United States will help its uh, um, allies in Central and Eastern Europe, but obviously Article 5 does not allow uh, NATO to fight in Ukraine, which is not a NATO member yet, so uh, NATO uh, troops will not enter Ukraine even if it's under attack. Um, so yes, I think that's it from my side. I'm sorry for prolonging it, but I tried to wrap it up at the end as quickly as possible. OK, uh, th thank you very much for Agatha. For that. That's an excellent talk and, and it's really given us a very thorough uh, idea of the backgrounds to the uh, to the Ukrainian uh, conflict. So um, hopefully uh, uh, if you haven't got um, haven't got uh, teaching coming up or um, you, you can you can stay around and um, pose some questions for Agatha. So please, uh, if you have some que questions for Agatha, um, please uh, uh, use the uh, little uh, question um, toolbar on the top. Um, and I think Agatha posed one question about whether uh, a legal question about whether um, Ukraine has a continuing right to self-defense against um, Russian occupation. And th then th that's a, again a question uh, which which would be good to have some some views on. Does the occupation of territory can create a continuing right of self-defense or has that uh, right effectively um, expired uh, after a period of time. So any any views uh, on that uh, would be would, would be great. Um, and just uh, just sort of can I sort of pose a, a question to sort of get thing, things going? Um, I mean, one of the things that um, is, uh, as you say, is before the the Duma at the moment is this question about recognizing uh, uh, Donetsk and Luhansk as, as separate states. Now, legally, of course, you could see some of the reasons for that, that it might then allow Russia to le uh, sort of officially put peacekeepers into those republics. It could even um, pave the way for um, Russia to annex um, those republics. But at the same time, I, I think there was a feeling that um, the reason why uh, Russia went into Donetsk and Luhansk after Crimea was to create uh, um, some uh, a sort of Kremlin controlled area of Ukraine, which would remain part of Ukraine. And this was this, this was part of the Russian attempt to still maintain leverage um, over Ukraine. Does that then sort of represent does this then represent a sort of abandonment of that policy that or, or is it or is it possible that they are actually just going for a straightforward coup, uh, an overthrow of the government in Ukraine? 
Yeah, um, well, I think that in general, the dream of Putin would be to ex uh, have the, the similar control over Ukraine as it was uh, during Soviet times. So I think that Donetsk and Luhansk republics are very, uh, very straight and forward goals because they are so close to the Russian border and there are so many Russian citizens there. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think that this is a very good start. And if Putin sees that he is not able to go farther in the territory of Ukraine, I think he will just stop with the uh, Luhansk and Dudanis and at least try to exercise um, uh, the, the control, effective control over these territories. I'm sorry for my pronunciation uh, of uh, Slovene names, but I always never know how to pronounce it in English and I always pronounce it in a Slovene way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, any any questions uh, from the, is there any, any uh, no, turned up. Any questions for Agatha? Just leave this leave this open for a few more minutes. So please, if you if you have questions, um, send them over now. One thing I was, I was kind of curious about was um, uh, amongst the states that supported the annexation, there was Afghanistan. Now this was a time, yes. of course, when the Americans, you know, were were, were propping up the. Uh, the government there. So why would they, why would they take that position? I wonder. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I think that um, Russia always tried to also establish some control over Afghanistan. Uh, just to mention the intervention in the 80s. So um, I guess it always wanted to in, uh, to extend its sphere of influence also there. So uh, I guess there are still some maybe connections between uh, Russia and Kabul that uh, go back to, to, to the 80s, mm -hmm. uh, to the past. So, so maybe that's the reason of it. But yeah, this is a very curious case. It is, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the others are, I mean, you could see the, the, only, the only former Soviet state that, um, that recognized it was Kyrgyzstan, which I suppose pointedly... Yeah doesn't border russia yeah so so it has less yeah. to fear from um from the, the from from sort of a russian annexation that's true yeah and there's also if i can jump in the part the question of transnistria yeah. which is also under russian influence and they have the russian there is, i was in transnistria last year actually mm -hmm. so i saw the huge russian military bases there so the possible attack for, for Ukraine can also come from the part of Transnistria. So. Yeah. yeah. How, how does Russia keep uh, Transnistria supplied? Because it must rely on Ukraine to supply Transnistria. Uh, well, I guess uh, they are paying off Transnistria's debts because mm -hmm. there is a lot of it. They are uh, simply financing their economy and because without Russia's support, uh, Transnistria's economy would collapse. Uh, and it's, of course, also a huge political influence. Um, I guess Moldova will have a huge problem with Transnistria when it uh, will start uh, the serious advanced negotiations with the EU because the Transnistria issue has to be settled by then. But uh, I think that uh, I think that even uh, Maya Spanu, the new president in Moldova, she she even talked with uh, the uh, representatives of Putin about Transnistria. So she's not talking with the authorities of Transnistria. She's talking with representatives of Putin. Mm, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so you know where the power lies, really. Um, yeah, I, I, th I think we haven't had any any new questions, so I think. Unless someone very quickly sends something, I think we'll 